Okay, we're live. Ladies and gentlemen, hi, uh, my name is Sarah Pollack and let me welcome you to the NextGen event in cooperation with Microsoft and the Aspen Institute Central Europe. Um, we're going to be asking some pretty big questions today, namely, is the era of nation states over? Um, what exactly has COVID done to our social structures? What role does technology have to play in this regard? It's going to be a big, multidisciplinary, very exciting conversation. I'm very excited to be joined by some of the top experts in their fields, ranging from archaeology, architecture, the British Army, artificial intelligence, and cryptocurrencies. Before I go into introducing all these wonderful people and moderating the discussion itself, um, let me please introduce Josef Miller, who is the Deputy Director of Aspen Institute Central Europe, and he'll say a few words to begin us with. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure uh, to be able to welcome you today on behalf of the Aspen Institute Central Europe at this amazing event, the future of forming a society in the cloud. The event is organized under the umbrella of the NextGen Network, which is a uh, collective action led by the Aspen Institute International Partners and Microsoft. And it brings together young leaders to develop an understanding of how new technologies like artificial intelligence will affect their lives and societies. Within the NextGen program, Aspen Central Europe already organized a public debate beyond human, trust in machines and AI. And we also organized an expert workshop, Building the Future, addressing the opportunities and challenges of AI-enabled world. The topic of technologies, innovation, and AI is one of our top program priorities. So we are really glad we can organize um, this kind of international event. Uh, the NextGen Network brings together young leaders uh, to develop understanding of how new technologies like AI uh, will affect uh, their lives and societies. Um, we have over 130 people uh, within the network and it includes leaders from technology, business, policy, journalism and civil society in Mexico, Germany, in UK and of course uh, Central Europe. Uh, now back to you, Sarah, and everyone enjoy the event. Thank you so much, Josef. Um, I think that because we're going to be discussing a lot of quite heavy themes, um, uh, it's it's not going to be easy, you know, taking questions like, um, can does is there any point in the nation state? Um, is there any point of carrying on with the social structures that we're used to? Looking into the history of the nation state itself, which actually is pretty modern. It was first ratified roughly 1648 by the Treaty of Westphalia. And the way that we live in Europe and America these days is pretty much the heritage of the last 150, 200 years. We've had implications from the general public in various elections um, that um, they're somewhat maybe dissatisfied with the status quo. Um, we've had some surprising election results um, and it's all been a little bit chaotic, but it's always been under the lid somewhat. COVID has blown that lid straight off and it has accelerated technological change, but with socio-psychological implications for the world around us. Um, but that's enough me ranting on uh, because I could be here all day and it'll be much more interesting to introduce the actual speakers taking part. Um, so first of all, we have Josef J, who's from the Ethereum Foundation. Um, he uh, lives deeply in the world of currency, specifically Ethereum and its um, kind of implications for society. So looking at it from both the technological and social perspective. Welcome, Josef. Hey there, thanks for me. Thanks for the invite. Thank you for being here with us. Um, we also have um, Tomasz Mikolov from the Czech Institute of Informatics, Robotics and Cybernetics, um, X. Microsoft, Google, Facebook, and I wanted to say he found his fame, but that makes him sound like a Hollywood actor. Um, he's incredibly impressive in the fact that he did find his fame on Word to Vec, but since has moved um, into the research artificial general intelligence um, and co complex systems and uh, all the amazing stuff that he knows much better how to explain than me. So, Tamash, welcome. Uh, yeah, hello, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Amazing, it's good to have enthusiasm. Um, we also have Karel Smekal, who's an architect. Um, he's also the interested in the psychology of architect. Him, we'll be discussing um, exactly the kind of relationship between urbanism, between the psychology of people and society. Um, and he's also the co-founder of the Inspirelli Awards. So Karel, welcome. 
Uh, thanks, Sarah, for this uh, lovely, lovely introduction, and I hope that we will enjoy this discussion. <laughs> Thank you. I don't hope, I know. Um, it's going to be awesome. Um, and of course, contributing to this vibe, last but not least, um, Edmund Owen, captain of the UK Army and also the alumnus of the University of Oxford. And I dare say a very dear friend of mine um, who um, we went to Oxford together. So there's a lot of history there, which we won't necessarily be talking about today um, because it doesn't involve pubs at all. Um, but welcome, Edmund. Great to have you here. Thank you very much, Sarah. I'm very much looking forward to uh, the debate. I think it should be, should be definitely an interesting one. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, before I ask the first questions to our uh, esteemed speakers that I've just introduced to you, I'd also like to remind you to um, join us on Slido because we want you to join the discussion as well because it's not a discussion if the public is not involved. Um, so use the uh, code hashtag AspenNextGen as you can see at the bottom of the screen. Um, and now for the first question, um, is the era of nation states over? Um, let's start from the very end of the speaker list. Um, so let's go in reverse. Edmund, what do you think? It's really, I think it's a really interesting question, especially considering what's going on in um, Afghanistan at the moment, or sort of largely what's just finished. So I think, you know, Kabul really demonstrates the, the fragility of the sort of colonial states that have been um, created by the West. Um, you know, may, maybe are those coming to an end, potentially? You know, are they breaking up? Yes, potentially. But I still really think that, you know, uh, the, the, the state is, is the nexus of political activity. We don't really, as far as I can see, have, uh, you know, a solid alternative to it you know we the, the state is linked to the nation the people culture identity I and mean, it's how we organize ourselves um mm -hmm. it's also sort of based on this idea you know obviously I, i'm interested in uh in being in the army uh, you know what, what does the army provide and what does the state provide mm -hmm. and, and the state really provides protection as a core so you know this Rousseauian contract basically saying that you know the state has the monopoly of violence no one else uh, is allowed to use it and and so i I can't foresee that sort of dying because, you know, what, what, what is the alternative to this monopoly on violence? You know, um, th there needs to be a sort of an organization, uh, as it were, that, that sort of that controls that. Yeah, thank you. you. You raised a really interesting point of um, post-colonialism and also the kind of Euro-American perception of the status quo that like yes like this is absolutely right and this is the way that society should be organized and then all it takes is for one to go 2000 kilometers in a different direction and the status quo is completely different um but what, what really interested me is like the state monopoly on something and traditionally one of the things that the state had a monopoly on was money um with the rise of cryptocurrencies Joseph, i'm curious whether what seemed to be kind of unshakable um, statist aspects, like for example, finances, suddenly you have that moved into a decentralized technological kind of realm. What does that mean for the nation state? Yeah, I guess like we, we are starting to see that now when like most of the nation states or, you know, these like larger bodies are trying to kind of like catch up their kind of like regulatory frameworks and, and just wrap their minds around like what actually crypto is. And it didn't really happen to the extent uh, until like very recent, uh, recently, like you probably heard of the the infrastructural bill and kind of the implications for, for the crypto industry there. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, for, for me, it's like very, very interesting to just like witness what's, what's going on, like how people are reasoning about like these technologies, because um, in my opinion, like the cryptocurrencies are still like pretty early and like if, if there was an actual actual like push on the nation state to like try to regulate cryptocurrencies like in the in the kind of like the global extent right because that's that's kind of one of the um main um main benefits or like main, main purposes of like cryptocurrency being you know like not located in one place or it's like not one single government that can that can just simply like shut it down um but yeah, I think it will be like interesting to start seeing these attempts to to actually like uh, constrain usage of cryptocurrencies in like the different jurisdictions, and also uh, the the more interesting part of that will be seeing the reactions and like seeing a like other nation states trying to like um, you know like take the opportunity and uh, kind of like create an environment or just like facilitate these types of services uh, to other nationals as well, um, but as well to you know like kind of discover what like the crypto community as like one of the examples of like a cloud cloud living society 
uh, will bring to the table as, as like the new, uh, you know, like a separate defense against like just just one sided regulation. Interesting. Thank you. Um, and cyber defense is definitely something that we'll um, get into a little bit later as well, and the different means of protection of uh, not only individuals, but also um, communities. But actually, what you kind of point at there is a growing uh, gap between the technological community and like the legislative reality. And one of the things that's been a particular thorn in the technological community's eye, specifically artificial intelligence, is the regulation that was um, put forward um, this April uh, by uh, the European Union. And Tomáš, I'd maybe like to um, kind of point to you here. Um, you have some really interesting um, views having lived in the US and seeing the way that data is handled and traded um, and then suddenly someone comes in and they want to regulate it. Um, what is your opinion of like how the state and the regulation of technologies comes together and whether it's even possible to combine? Uh, well, that's uh, certainly a difficult topic uh, if you think of it. Uh, in the recent years, uh, we did see that uh, there are like global companies, global technological companies uh, that are using the technology that uh, we call AI and uh, using it for like uh, making a lot of money out uh, outside um, using uh, large data sets uh, uh, that are coming from uh, from basically like people all around the world. And uh, if you think of it from the global point of view, Europe is actually quite behind uh, areas like uh, the US or China. And uh, I think that uh, this can be this can be quite a disadvantage into the future, because if you think of it, uh, we are already like uh, as Europeans, we are behind. Uh, these uh, these other countries and uh, we are trying to regulate even like uh, the use uh, and development of uh, new technologies uh, in Europe. Uh, so basically, if you are trying to catch the others while actually uh, creating artificial obstacles uh, for for yourself, I, I don't think this is uh, this is the best uh, thing to do. I think that in the, in the for example, modern uh, impact the society. Then I think that the first thing to do would be to actually uh, have our own services to to be on a competitive level with uh, with the US and again like uh, with China and, and uh, regulate uh, um, industry that will not exist uh, in Europe. Yeah, in interesting and. Um... Uh, it, it becomes, I mean, what you always say as a metaphor is like if someone kind of like, speaking of neo-colonialism as well, uh, if someone opens a diamond mine and takes all the diamonds, then you might have a problem with it if they start taking it out of your country. But with data, because that's so ethereal and you can't necessarily put your fingers on it, um, trading data and sending them to, for example, US servers or, or like somewhere completely different, that's becoming a topic that doesn't really have any precedence. And because people can't touch it, they can't really imagine the implications. Um, so uh, also a point I'd like to get back to in the debate, but finally, um, just for the kind of initial round of questions to Karel, because architecture is definitely something that you can touch, um, and architecture is also something that encompasses the culture of a nation state and where culture and identity and leadership is often manifested. Um, you're an architecture psychologist. How do you view uh, the people's relation with the physical world and how that is related to the nation state and maybe changing as well? Uh, thank you. Uh, I thought about that uh, <laughs> uh, for a while, and uh, I think that uh, it's very, very important to go a little bit back uh, to the core of this uh, question because uh, everything is up to up to humans and their behavior. And uh, at the beginning, uh, I think that uh, everybody wants to to belongs to any, anything. Yeah? So I think that uh, nation states uh, or some group of people still uh, will still exist. When you look uh, back to Czechoslovakia before, uh, we, we, dis we decided to be uh, split into two countries. And uh, from my point of view, it's, uh, it's uh, very nice because I have a lot of friends in Slovakia. Uh, a lot of friends from Slovakia has uh, friends in Czech, Czech Republic and everything works very, very good way. However, it works good way only because we were members of European Union and there were no borders. Let's imagine how it would be in case uh, there will be uh, this uh, split uh, without the European Union. There will be immediately borders and then uh, when uh, the people would like to come, uh, for example, to Slovakia, there will be some issues on the border and uh, immediately there will be uh, hateness between, between people. And uh, because we were in a bigger, bigger community, 
uh, without any borders, uh, we cooperate very, very good way. I think that the future, uh, maybe, maybe I can uh, uh, remember another narrate from my, from my uh, experience. When we traveled with my wife uh, in uh, French, in, uh, in uh, Brittany, we met a lot of people uh, who talk uh, with us about, uh, about how they hate uh, French, yeah? how, how they want to be separated. And uh, for us, it was a surprise because we didn't know that uh, in French, French people would like to be uh, divided like, uh, like in Spain. Uh, and uh, I think that the future would be that uh, the, the countries will be a little bit split to a small groups of uh, nations. So it will be according to their uh, origin, I think, uh, ac uh, according to their languages and, and habits. And then it will be covered uh, by European Union, uh, United States or some big, uh, big uh, beneficial uh, sort of economic uh, economic uh, alliances. So this is this is the way how it uh, goes on. So we will we will see, uh, for example, China. I think that they will be absolutely this, this country will be destroyed. And uh, I don't know, maybe it will it will last uh, one year, ten years, one hundred years. But uh, no doubt, it's uh, it's a country of full of another uh, nations, and uh, they will not be uh, happy to be together. So, and then, uh, again, it will be somehow uh, unified. I, I think this will happen. This is my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so I, I think what, what has um, kind of resonated throughout is that we're looking at some kind of an like, ideal status quo, like the ideal optimized way of how to run a society, how to make sure that everyone's happy and everything's regulated the right way and everyone's protected. Um, is, is that utopia? And is the, for example, European way of doing things with like the democratic, the democratic system that we have now, which is basically a, an invention of classical Greece, um, is that the right way forward or is there something else? And I'll open it uh, up to the speakers. Okay, so maybe I will take it because I saw that it is my question. Uh, I think that uh, when you look at uh, the wars, uh, uh, for example, uh, in, in Iraq, uh, it was it was war between between two countries, yeah, United States and, and uh, Iraq. And why does uh, it has happened? And because my from my opinion, because of sources, yeah. And uh, let's imagine the same conflict uh, between uh, Texas and I don't know Washington. Uh, wh what will be happening there? It will not be war. It will be uh, it will be some court uh, issue. So it means that uh, I think it's not utopia to be uh, somehow uh, in some unity. Uh, under one one I don't know name, and then all the issues can be solved uh, a little bit better way than it is uh, happening now in the in the in the world. So it's I hope that it's not utopia. It, it is real. <laughs> so I think um, I, I think it's interesting. You know, we we sort of talk about so Iraq's a particularly interesting one. So large, largely that's about resources, right? So you know, oil linking to the petrodollar. Um, you know, sort of maintaining oil prices, that sort of thing. I mean, like very controversial in my own opinion um, of it. But this sort of harks back to what the nation state is supposed to do, which is effectively to, 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 to protect those under it, right? Because there's not really anyone else that is going to protect your, your own, your, you know, sort of you as a group um, or you as an individual. And I think, you know, this, this idea of utopia is an interesting one, but mm, I'm not really sure where it goes. In terms of you know, like the, the societies aren't linear in their progression; they progress in different ways, um, you know, based off the geography that's around them, the environment, whatever it is. So you know, to sort of to to maybe focus on this concept of a utopia, like an end an end goal that is good, and all societies sort of you know should be should be going towards that. I think it's sort of you like you're setting yourself up for failure. I think you know it should be you know we need to look at what what should a good society do, you know yeah a good society do and in my mind that's you know provide protection um you know security freedoms that sort of stuff you know and so so if a cloud society can do that fine but you know it, but because it's so ethereal you know we were talking we were talking about money earlier the, I, I tried to find an english uh 10, 10 pound note but on on the english money it says uh effectively the crown promises promises to pay the bearer of this note x amount of money so that money is a is 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 a promise, but backed up by a government, right? So you know, it used to be linked to, to gold, the gold standard, and that sort of thing. You know, this uh, sort of stuff like uh, was it Ethereum or the uh, cryptocurrency stuff? That's not backed up by anything. It's 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 so completely conceptual 
um, that, you know, people won't want to, I don't think, you know, invest their sa life savings into it because it can just go up and down. It can be wiped off. You know, people want control over the money. They want to almost be able to see it, right? Um, and that's what, you know, a, a, um, a, a real in-life society, government, whatever, provides. It's It's a sort of a reassurance, I suppose. You mentioned something really interesting. I'm sure that Josef will want to react, but Tomas, yeah, no, go for it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry, there's some delay between us, but yeah, I wanted to, to continue on this maybe with, uh, with some question because I also like think that uh, uh, a society is like providing some uh, some basics, uh, basic services to the members of the society. And one of the most important one is uh, actually the security. And if you think of it, uh, a cloud society is uh, certainly like uh, something that is becoming a reality. You have like uh, like people organizing in all kind of ways. Uh, you have uh, say uh, people playing some computer games and they create some virtual societies with millions of members and it's uh, it's all nice and it goes across all the borders and uh, and creates friendships uh, across continents and I think it's uh, it's all cool. But once you go to things like society, uh, like security, how can actually uh, like virtual uh, society provides security to its members when it's actually very much related to the physical location because you know like uh, uh, you want to kind of like uh, protect uh, the members of the society uh, from uh, from like uh, some uh, some other members of other society that uh, that maybe want to invite you, your home and steal steal some some things from you so my uh, like uh, open-ended question maybe also for the others and also like because I would like to understand this topic uh, better would be like uh, how could possibly uh, like uh, like a cloud society provide the same level of services, uh, especially in the area of security, as the nation states? It's a, it's a great question. Um, yeah. I, I maybe uh, this maybe kind of like goes on to the uh, topic that Josef already mentioned, which is cybersecurity and the fact that um, like w we almost call it like digital martial arts of knowing how to behave on the internet, how to make sure that your digital trace is protected. Um, so I think that we're talking about two kinds of security here: the one online and the one. It, physically like someone beating you up in the street versus someone stealing all your money online um Josef, how does this work particularly maybe in relation to uh either, like the ethereum foundation is it a concept that you guys are fleshing out as well uh no, not really i don't i would just want to make clear that uh, i'm not really speaking on behalf of the ethereum foundation so these are just like my my personal opinions um but I, I think it was like rightfully mentioned that there is certainly this, you know, difference between um, uh, just like the the physical and the digital world. And uh, <laughs> sorry, it's uh, my daughter making making sense. Uh, but um, uh, I guess like in the question of cloud societies, I don't I don't think like you know cloud societies will completely replace like all the functions of like a what a regular, what we consider like a physical or like a real life society would uh, would look like. Uh, but uh, in my opinion, like these sort of, um, you know, like systems and mechanisms uh, just really all are built on top of like what we what we have now. So in my opinion, it's not about like, you know, just like taking, taking like what there is and just like replacing it and you know crushing the old system and just like building a, a new system on top of on top of the old one uh, but for me it's like much more gradual and p part of that part of that process is also kind of uh, you know like realizing that um, kind of the notion notion of wealth and kind of the, the stuff that's worth to be protected is also shifting obviously like uh, uh, you know, it's it's definitely simpler for me from the, the comfort of Europe to be to be like uh, telling to other people that uh, well, there is like a whole bunch of you know whole bunch of the, the new wealth that's being created is like purely digital, and that's where you know that's where uh, the cloud societies like play a bigger role than than the physical ones even, um, and you know looking looking towards the future like. Uh, it, unless there will be like a major major breakdown of like uh, just the pillars of what you know what, what the current nation states like stayed on or not even the nation states but really just like the the municipalities and the way like how people function and uh you know in um in towns and and just like villages um then it's pretty much you know pretty much probable that uh the, the new 
societies will be just kind of like rooted in in the old system somehow where the old system might just like start losing relevance uh to a point where yeah people won't be so you know cautious about their like i guess like physical you know physical security because well that's not where the game will be played um but you can see it already now you know like all of the stuff being built in the in this like metaverse um using like DAOs and just like s stupid games or um or you, you know like shifting value to from like jurisdiction based licensing into nfts and um and somewhat like more global notion of like what we consider to be the the, the ruling truth in a sense because that's often also what what the nation state provides right it's just like a register of like who owns what but now there is there is like a global database for it that can be used in you know regardless on of your like nationality um so i see that transition rather from you know this like very location-based or just like a nation-based kind of thinking into this like globalized realm where uh you know ideally like we wouldn't we wouldn't really have to worry about um uh, about like nation states attacking each other uh but uh we could kind of like uh, just like have this universal truth of like who owns what and just be fine with that not having to you know like fight each other because it wouldn't really help us to get to the the, the belongings of like other communities in in the system um but then we could perhaps like focus on uh you know like other more interesting interesting parts of like uh you know discovering discovering the space and, and kind of like pushing technologies forward instead of just uh you know focusing on well one nation state attacking another because that will be irrelevant uh you know if, if we can get to a place where uh it, it it won't be just about like the strongest player you know setting the rules of like uh, uh you know ownership of like property and land and like whoever has the biggest guns because then it, it won't be just like up to the one player in the system it, it literally will be about like the entire world like collaborating and up till this point i don't think we actually had the means to you know achieve that large scale um coordination but like with things like blockchain and for me like things like ethereum or even DAOs, I, I think like the you know uh the tools are you know coming to its existence to, to their existence so hopefully uh we'll be able to solve like a larger coordination issues through more like decentralized notion of of governance rather than just you know having a discussion about who has, who has more guns Okay. What can a I, can I <laughs> I'm going to be out of a job. <laughs> so, sorry? I'm, I'm going to be out of a job if that happens. You, uh, you won't need a job. I'm, you, you'll, be, you'll be just <laughs> <no> farming. <laughs> what, what, yeah, exactly. Skipping around the, uh, the fields. So what, what, one thing I would ask, though, um, you know, if we're going to have this sort of free society, one, one of the things that I sort of at its source right, what happens if they switch the internet off? You know, like say so it's not it's not free. It can't be free because someone controls the uh, you know Marx Marxian you know controlling the means of labor or whatever it's called. Um, you know, so someone controls the flipping internet, and once that's turned off, um, you know that society is literally like physically is nowhere. I don't know. Yeah, but, uh, like, yeah like not like North Korea, right? But well, yeah, that part of society physically is nowhere uh, but it's also like super inefficient for like any nation state you just like cut them off from the internet because they would be just like losing so much money that is just like not feasible or at least i i think so but then if you look maybe, at what, maybe. what kind of their control over society you know there's no facebook the huge firewalls and you know, that sort of thing actually you know if i was a if i was a dictatorship i would i would absolutely want this cloud society thing to happen because it's far easier to control uh, a cloud society. All I need is better, better technicians uh, than 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 you know your, your, your normal everyday man, and I'll be able to very easily control people. And that doesn't sound pretty. That doesn't sound particularly utopian to me. I mean, I can barely turn my laptop on, let alone uh, you know engage in a cloud society. <laughs> uh, what if what if um, uh, the virtual uh, reality is still a part of reality? Uh, 
I have uh, I have experience with uh, with our project uh, Inspire Awards. It's uh, the biggest uh, world biggest students architecture competition, and uh, we are in touch with more than 142 countries. And uh, I would like to answer to Thomas uh, Thomas about the uh, society uh, uh, to say protection or or how they can help. Uh, before when I when I traveled uh, and I was back at my home and I I talked with uh, neighbors, they they didn't care about um, about what is happening in uh, in I don't know Azerbaijan, what is happening in in Iran, Iraq, because it was far away. And for me, it was absolutely different because uh, I was in touch with uh, those people. And uh, whenever anything happened to them, I, I was trying to contact them and offer help. And uh, it was at the beginning, of course, uh, our virtual connection. But then when things mm -hmm. happened, uh, I felt the responsibility. And I think that the responsibility is the answer on the question of uh, um, the future behavior of the, of the people. And uh, I think that doesn't matter if uh, there will be internet connection and or it will be close, uh, like in, in COVID, uh, something uh, is changed. And, and then uh, you find a way how to connect people different different way. Because, for example, right now we, we know each other uh, for, I don't know, uh, 10 minutes. Uh, and uh, I feel that, uh, that uh, I know you a little bit. And uh, let's let's imagine that after I don't know one year, uh, any of you will, will contact me that uh, you need something, and and uh, you will you will know what I'm doing, and uh, I will I will help you because I know you from virtual uh, virtual world. However, still it is the reality. So I I don't think that you are created by computer. I I feel that you are normal humans, and I think this is this is um, it will ever be here. Everything is a reality. Doesn't matter how we call it, uh, which uh, uh, devices we are using, and uh, maybe last, last, <laughs> last to add. Uh, uh, what about the globalization? I heard a, a lot about globalization, but whenever I need anything in uh, in country, for example, in Nepal or in Cameroon, I need to know people there. Uh, it's it's uh, by Facebook. I will do nothing. I need to call them. Uh, I need to talk with them. So I think that society is still the same like it was uh, hundreds of years ago. Still, we would like to meet. Still, we would like to love somebody. We would like to take care about somebody. So this will be the same, I think. Thank you. Um, uh, we, we've wow, we've kind of really kicked it off, and we've covered a lot, and we've kind of moved over from almost like the evolutionary principles of society, like exchange. What Edmund mentioned in terms of, uh, for example, the British pound being backed up by the government, um, and, but then again, like uh, for example, like the notions of reciprocity, like Marcel Mauss discusses, and the fact that we had literally people trading shiny beads thousands of years ago that also weren't really backed by anything, and the golden standard. I'll, um, I'll, I'll jump in there to finish off what, uh, what, what Sarah was saying. So you talk about M Marcel Mousse, who um, really looked at reciprocity. So um, it's called the, the Kula Ring. So basically a series of islands um, in Indonesia, I think. Um, and uh, what he looked at sort of the first time, he realized that actually most human relationships are based off reciprocity. So, you know, I'll give you, uh, you know, sort of a, um, a necklace of, uh, you know, particularly beautiful um like seashells um, and therefore there's a relationship that you have uh, then you built you know and that goes around and around and around and so i think sorry sorry are you are you back on now i just i, I tried to jump in there <laughs> no okay um yeah so 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 that's sort of the basis of how oh uh, well he argues you know we, we we create these relationships and you know sort of with the same sort of thing applies with less less so with money and i think you know maybe thomas i'd, I'd like to hear your opinion on this um you know m maybe with with a sort of bit bitcoin as well it's even it's even less sort of personalized because you know I, again i don't really know how it started but bitcoin is sort of it's it's dark webby it's it's really anonymous it's you know it's not linked to to the individual so you can't have that reciprocal relationship with people uh yeah, I don't know. Like, I would probably not be commenting so much on, on the Bitcoin because I'm uh, I'm not an uh, expert on the in the on the cryptocurrencies. Maybe just continuing on that uh, uh, evolutionary principles that actually Sarah mentioned in the societies. I think that's uh, so what I've been actually thinking of uh, in the last uh, two minutes about like that. It uh, 
maybe also like worth uh, thinking about because uh, well there's actually no goal like for for our societies we can have our ideals that we think uh, are like worthy to pursue like uh, we have some um, some opinion about like uh, how a good civilization uh, civilization should look like uh, uh, what are what are the bad ones uh, but this is not like some uniform truth uh, and uh, you have like a different uh, cultures in different parts of the world that have actually different uh, values uh, and it's actually like the evolution that uh, decides uh, what survives basically it's a simple mechanism like uh, the societies that uh, that are kind of like stronger in some sense uh, are the ones that uh, that succeed it's a uh, it's not a societies where actually everybody's happy and where people share some nice values yeah. and uh, and so on and uh, you know this worldwide peace it all sounds good but uh, if you look uh, into the history I think there was this saying that uh, if you, if you want peace, you should prepare for a war, and I think uh, it's uh, it's the same with uh, with these uh, idealistic uh, opinions about like uh, the future societies where all the world will unite and everybody will be happy. Well, I think that uh, there's also this eruption that uh, if we just depend on the virtual world uh, too much uh, because it's kind of embedded in the physical world, uh, world which uh, also like Vaslo mentioned that uh, there can be some like enemy society that will. For example, cut off uh, the internet connection for some country, and it will go into a chaos because uh, all, all these things uh, that are being uh, done like on internet will be now impossible. We will not even be able to pay for anything uh, if you will destroy the databases of all these financial transactions. Uh, it's actually even true for our they don't really need uh, need uh, cryptocurrencies even in the, our, our current uh, society. If you would be able to attack like uh, the bank records, then you would create tons of chaos, and uh, it would be very easy to conquer countries uh, where actually destroy their economy first and where everything is basically not uh, not working at all so i think that uh, that's the other issue that we didn't uh, really discuss here i think that we were going uh, a bit too idealistic but uh, following all the security concerns uh, there's uh, there's this issue that uh, if a significant part of uh, of our lives uh, um, transfers to the virtual world uh, which is actually also like a uh, like uh, sensitive to some type of attacks then maybe that will actually create a weaker society and uh, maybe uh, that will actually lead to some parts of the world to be conquered by other countries which will actually be not so virtual and uh, basically replace the, the given system there uh, with, uh, with something else so just trying to look uh, at, uh, at things from the other side so that we we don't uh, end up with some utopia and like discussions too quickly and certainly a good point. I mean, just to follow up, so follow up on on the previous previous note of like uh, you know cutting cutting off like other countries' internet or just like finding the weaker spot, and that's you maybe like answer the the question. And Sarah was actually asking me. Uh, uh, like, I, I feel that decentralization of the internet system is like a crucial part for like cryptocurrencies or like these societies to work in general. Uh, because yeah, like if you if you like build that system on like very big basis where you basically just create like a single point of failure in the very beginning and then you say like and from now on everything is decentralized well yeah then you just like introduced uh uh introduce a bottleneck in the system uh so that's perhaps like one uh one approach that the f is certainly taking which is uh kind of like decentralization on like many many different layers even from perspective of like uh how these well a how the network looks looks like as you know just a uh physical um like manifestation like actually being like decentralized in terms of like locations and number of nodes uh which is certainly not something that like EF can do by itself but it really depends like on the people you know like in general in any any like blockchain blockchain related topic is is on the people running the nodes like either having like strong incentive to run a node or just being altruistic and like providing that as a as a service but there are many different layers of that like you know, decentralization of like the client base, like uh, the, you know, the actual software that, that runs the network also has to be decentralized in a sense. You don't want to rely on a single team, on a single development team. On, you don't want to rely on single like implementation language and so on. So you can, you can go like very, very deep into, um, you know, how, how robust uh, can, can the system be built up. Uh, but yeah, certainly not saying not saying uh, well everything everything is going to be like awesome and and colorful and uh, there will be like rainbows and unicorns running on the world because like we'll be all united. To which 
one last comment. It's also kind of funny because most of the time we actually talk about like nation states attacking other nation states. So it's like, well, yeah, well, that there is a problem. Uh, well, some nation states are. Can I, can I just ask a quick By question, Jesus? Oh, oh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, no, no, I just wanted to say, um, you don't even need to switch off North Korea, you can just switch off Sarah's internet. And then <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you um, for, for fill, filling in. Um, and I've got a, a couple more questions on uh, evolution and freedom and the role of the individual, but um, I'll let you, Edmund, ask this question because it sounds interesting. Right, it, it was just the last one, just just on um, sort of the level of anonymity you would get in this in this cloud society. Like I said, this is more, more for Joseph. So if you look at the dark web, like I don't know much about it, but it, you know, things like Silk Road, so, you know, drugs and guns and that sort of stuff, um, down to, you know, some pretty, there's some pretty dark stuff on there, you know, that people, I mean, I think we all know what, I, what, I'm, what I'm talking about, you know, so people don't want to be found, they, they want to be anonymous, um, you know, and actually it sort of facilitates some pretty, pretty bad high level crime, you know, organized crime, um, crime against individuals, crime against children, all that sort of stuff. So in this cloud society, how do we, maintain a balance between you know this this anonymity but then also sort of allow for this connection um you know and and, and how is that how is that effectively policed if people have things like tools and all that sort of that, all that sort of thing well to, to that like I, I think like people already have these tools like now already like you know it's, it's the same argument of like well you have a tool you can use it for like various stuff and i don't i don't think that's actually like a solvable issue through like technology itself like i think that's a solvable issue to education and just like you know like building up social standards that are strong enough uh but yeah you can make the same argument about like cars or telephones you know uh well yeah organized crime is often organized through telephones well maybe we should you know ban them but i so think this is actually sorry go on sarah um, no, it's just an interesting point because basically it's one of the things that we discuss a lot in um, Parallel Polis, which is the idea of uh, cypherpunk and the the um, right to anonymity um, and protecting you yourself as an individual because that's one of the ways that you can protect yourself online. Um, ciphering stuff has been something that's been happening for thousands of years and has been a means of protection. But funnily enough, um, and Edmund, you know this as well as I do in terms of archaeology, archaeology doesn't normally focus on the individual, and it's, unless it's some rich princess with a lot of gold that looks good in the British Museum. Um, you don't study things like homelessness and pe people that are hidden under like the layers and individuals who are escaping the system because there's simply no archaeological trace. It's going to be much easier to do that in the digital world, but I think that history has censored out these people and so we only tend to focus on analyzing the big structures and the big nations and the big organizations and actually the individual is escaping and I wanted to ask that Elvis actually you're a psychologist of architecture obviously architecture is linked with institutions and nations and cultures how is the individual represented in architecture and maybe with the use of public space but also private space It'd be really interesting to have your opinion on that as well <laughs> okay, so I, I will try to <laughs> to to find the uh, correct answer. Uh, I think that uh, I can I can maybe use uh, example of my of my own house. Uh, 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 what I'm trying I'm trying to to create uh, the house uh, which will be absolutely uh, satisfying all my demands. This is uh, this is the individuality. Uh, into process of architecture, and uh, I think that uh, it was uh, it was the same in a history. It is still right now, and it will be still in the future. So people will search for satisfying their demands, and uh, in case of architecture, they will they will try to find uh, the best um, uh, to say best best architecture uh, for that what they need to do, and um, maybe in in. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, nations, maybe to, to keep the content, uh, what we see now is that uh, whenever uh, I'm traveling, for example, I was uh, last two years in, uh, in Pakistan, I was in Sri Lanka, in Azerbaijan, in, in, uh, in uh, Beirut uh, two weeks ago. So what I, what I saw there is uh, that um, uh, there, are, there are a lot of uh, types of very similar buildings everywhere in the world. So we are losing uh, the identity. And I think that uh, 
it's not uh, of course uh, good for community uh, however maybe uh, we are only playing games that we are different because because of some traditions uh, in the base uh, we are we are the same so we would like to to not uh, freeze them do not freeze uh, we don't we want to to have uh, food and uh, to to have space for ourselves so individuality is a very important part of architecture and uh, maybe the focus of my uh, applied psychology of architecture is to find the balance between between architects as uh, as author of architecture and their responsibility for the clients and for the people and uh, to teach them to understand the community because maybe it is a big surprise for you all uh, architects uh, know knows nothing about people they study only only architecture as a, as a construction uh, point of view and uh, i think it is the biggest mistake and in history when you when you look the uh, when we go back to to uh, archaeology uh, how it was uh, happening in, in that time uh, architects were people uh, who create uh, homes for themselves yeah so uh, right now maybe we have an issue that uh, we are asking architects who are not informed about the human needs needs uh, too much and uh, we are not able to do it by ourselves maybe the same issue will be with the currency with the digital digital world that we are losing uh, capacity to understand what is going to hap happen around us this is the biggest issue i think for example maybe i can i can add uh, let's imagine that we have uh, our devices with internet so we have everything what uh, uh, all knowledge of humankind uh, we have on internet how we use our mobile phones how we how we use them to make a photo of our family and share it yeah this is this is nonsense let's imagine to bring it 100 years ago and to offer to some uh, scientists yeah they will use absolutely different way we we don't know what we have we need to lose it for for a while and then we will <laughs> we will we will understand how powerful it was <laughs> so okay I think maybe, um, Tomáš, I have a question for you in this regard. Um, how, we're talking about power and powerful technologies. Uh, unfortunately, artificial intelligence has this um, aura of being dangerous and terminator. And uh, it, a lot of the times it's mentioned um, in, in parallel with China and the oppression of citizens, making this whole idea of a cloud society either a thing for the technological elite or for the people with the strongest servers. Um, what is your opinion of the role of artificial intelligence in this, like, I don't want to say brave new world because that sounds too dystopian, but um, uh, in, in this kind of new social structure. Well, I think that uh, that's even like a broader question about like the role of the technology itself, because you can see artificial intelligence as uh, uh, basically the, uh, the artificial intelligence of today. Um, things that uh, do exist uh, are basically applied math. Uh, it's computer science algorithms. Uh, it's basically like uh, just part of technology. So you can say that AI is kind of like uh, the thing as, uh, as programming or internet, uh, something on this level. So certainly it's uh, it's very useful, but I would not overblow uh, its importance. And especially when it comes to some science fiction story that try to claim that uh, we are getting close to some sort of like a singularity where, when people will, when computers will become self-aware and start thinking on their own. and. Uh, and just uh, take over over like the power on the world and uh, erase all the humanity. That's that's science fiction. Like uh, we don't have anything of this sort. Uh, uh, nobody knows how to uh, make uh, smart thinking computers. We are nowhere close to it. So I think that uh, often uh, in this area we are discussing uh, topics uh, that are like uh, Star Trek level. Like uh, they may be relevant 300 years from now, but uh, but today I think uh, we should be focusing on things that are right in front of us and. Uh, uh, what is right in front of us uh, are like uh, are like things. Uh, how can we make, for example, AI more useful for the society? The type of AI that we already have. Uh, I think that one area that uh, that uh, can benefit greatly is, for example, healthcare. We did see it in the COVID crisis that uh, most of the countries uh, didn't actually use statistical analysis of the data sets. Uh, also, we do have this technology for a long time, and we know it would help. Uh, there was uh, there was. Uh, huge mess uh, when it comes to like uh, dealing with the data uh, and uh, even like making some predictions uh, using the data sets correctly uh, gathering the data sets maintaining the data sets there was the case uh, i think in slovakia 
where I think the Ministry of Healthcare would even uh, allow some some unintentional leak of a huge data set uh, with names of, uh, of, uh, of uh, all the people together with uh, their physical addresses and so on. So uh, you, you can actually see that uh, the nation states uh, actually are failing uh, on many levels uh, in this regard. Uh, and I think that the uh, adoption of uh, new technology uh, by by mm, nations that are led, uh, uh, let's be uh, let's be completely honest about it, um, that are led by people who are often like 70, 80 years old and uh, don't even know what a computer is. I think that uh, there's some sort of like a distortion between like uh, how quickly the world changes and how quickly uh, the uh, standard democratic processes can actually incorporate uh, the recent changes uh, uh, to the society. Cryptocurrencies, in my opinion, are like another example where the states uh, in the last decade didn't know at all what to do with it. Uh, there are some attempts in some countries to uh, to uh, start some regula uh, regulations, uh, but uh, in my opinion, most of the politicians are completely hopeless when it comes to technological questions because they don't have the education. And uh, often, like if you look at uh, the presidents of the, of the US, uh, uh, they are just simply too old to to understand uh, these type of things. Uh, so I think that uh, that's that's one th part of things that I would like to discuss. Also, I would uh, like to also like uh, uh, maybe continue a bit on the on the previous discussion about like the globalization. Maybe I would uh, just have slightly different view because I think that the globalization is actually pretty good uh, for the societies locally because uh, if you are a society that uh, developed uh, technology or some 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 other principles uh, that are kind of like outdated they are not state of the art uh, today it's very easy to take over the best solution in the world by just copying what somebody else is doing and that actually will help you locally so if for example you are building some inefficient buildings uh, uh, but some uh, some neighbor for example is, is making it uh, much cheaper and better then you can just copy it from him and uh, that will lead to this globalization your architecture will uh, start looking the same, you will lose the diversity, but locally people actually gain quite a bit out of it. So I think that locally globalization is good, but uh, but uh, actually globally, the globalization in my opinion is not good because uh, if you lose the diversity, you also like explore, you, you remove the exploration part. Uh, uh, so, um, you know, like uh, sometimes some solutions uh, don't work very well for some time until some, uh, some continuation is developed. Uh, and I, I, for example, see it a lot uh, in the research community the research communities and say machine learning AI that, uh, that explode in size in the last uh, maybe one or two decades uh, uh, and the number of participants at these conferences like much much higher like at least one order of magnitude but uh, if you look at uh, the number of like breakthrough discoveries I wouldn't really say that uh, it's uh, it's going anywhere faster because uh, you basically see thousands and thousands of people uh, researching the same ideas and doing basically the same experiments and I think that uh, that's the danger of globalization that uh, because we will lose diversity we will actually uh, invent less things uh, because we will explore explore less paths so i think that we have a couple of things emerging here um without a doubt we i think all agree that some form of revolution of the nation state ending and mm -hmm. immediately being replaced by some kind of cloud utopia that that's nonsense simultaneously we do see the kind of um, uh, the scissors kind of opening up between the nation state's reality and like like the, the, the dream that it was maybe a hundred years ago and that dream that is failing is being replaced by certain cloud services that are just working much better and that people are using more efficiently. But then what does that mean? Does that mean everyone should use the nation state in the same way? And if we're not, what implications does that have for voting and for taxes like if, if i'm only using the nation state for a specifically small thing and i'm using like the rest on cloud services or i have my i don't know maybe medical insurance and even another country and my mobile operator in a second country and i opened up my company in a third country um what what does that mean for me as an individual why should i be paying for example the same amount of taxes as someone who uses the state in a completely different way i'm not looking for a definitive answer i'm just throwing that into the lion's den um that i think that again the individual variability of the way that we move and exist in a society is not really being accounted for i think uh, if i can uh, uh i think that uh, everybody uh, <laughs> Uh, let's say uh, let's, let's a joke uh, everybody hates uh, cops uh, yeah and 
when you have an issue and you call them and they come uh, very very quickly then you love them yeah and i think uh, the same with uh, when you are uh, when you have problem and you need to go to to hospital uh, you you are really happy that uh, it works so i think that uh, to to stay in paying taxes <laughs> is very important and uh, you you hate it uh, when you when you need nothing from the state from the government but uh, when you need it uh, then then it's really good i think it's up to up to appropriate way how to explain it to people and how to weigh the balance between uh, paying uh, taxes uh, for 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 corruption uh, corruption government and politician or to pay it uh, smartly uh, and maybe it can help uh, some uh, AI or or another uh, internet solution which will uh, make a way how to pay only what you exactly want or uh, sometimes I, I thought that it would be nice to pay taxes and to see exactly how it was used. For example, to, to understand that uh, I don't know one two percentage was uh, for hospitality was seven hundred seven percentage for, for for I don't know mothers uh, uh, with one baby I don't know uh, maybe it can be uh, the way how to use uh, our technology because uh, when when Thomas uh, was uh, presenting his opinion I I thought uh, uh, that uh, it it is the same in our uh, brain. Yeah, uh, our brain we use uh, in uh, I don't know maybe maybe four percentage only of our brain we, we use or maybe ten percent maximum, and uh, the same is with the technology. When you look at uh, our technology uh, nowadays, uh, how how big percentage of this technology we we use uh, in our life? I think that uh, let's imagine to use it in one hundred percent, we will not uh, need to go to work. I think we will have all information very very quickly. And uh, the 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 world uh, can be in uh, as, as a utopia. However, we are not able to use our technology. We are using only a small part of it, as was said uh, by Thomas. But, but is, is, yeah, isn't yeah, this 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 is part of the? Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Is, isn't this part of the deal on. of? Isn't this part of the deal of society though? Which is which is basically like, you know if you want to be a member of society. You have to pay taxes. You have to give back. You know, so if you make more money, you pay more tax, and it's um, what's the word like sort of leveled up. So the more the more money you make, the more you make a tax and that sort of stuff. And and you know, hey, it's just one of those things. You have to pay. You know, to have a good a good society, um, you know, you have to contribute, and you 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 can't be a freeloader. You know, you you don't necessarily have uh, you know, the <laughs> the Rousseauian contract is is that you say okay, cool to get. This, you know, protection from the police to get health care to get whatever, uh, you know, there, there, there is a very, very clear cost to that. And actually, some people are going to have to pay more than other people, um, you know, because, hey, you know, for me, for example, I've, I've been very lucky in um, where, where I was born, um, you know, sort of family I was born into, that sort of thing. And therefore, I'm very happy to pay. Um, well, not have to pay taxes, obviously, but uh, you know, I, I, do, I do pay them uh, with a relative level of contentment because I get that other people don't, you know, necessarily have the same opportunities that I do. Um, I mean, I think it, it'd be really cool to. So I, I gave blood uh, ten weeks ago, something like that, um, and exactly as you say, um, Carol, I got to see, um, you know, wh where the blood was sent to and all that stuff. Great. I mean, the trying to organise that though would be uh, would be a hell of a thing. Really cool if we could see where our taxes go. But you know, imagine some some poor bloke at a computer with an enormous Excel spreadsheet trying to work that one out. It would be horrific. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think but that, but that's the thing. Pretty, um, uh, interesting oh. if uh, sorry, yeah, if, if it would be possible actually to to uh, connect uh, the taxes and the technology because many of the of the ways how the society currently works, it's uh, it's because of the historical reasons. Because uh, it would be impossible 50 years ago to uh, just go and uh, ask uh, people about how do they want to spend the taxes for this and that. Think uh, it, it was yeah. impossible. If you wanted to influence how the taxes are spent, uh, you would just uh, vote for for the party that you, uh, that has the most similar opinions to to yours, and that was the best thing uh, doable given the current state of the technology back uh, in the days. But today, I think it's. Uh, is this like uh, we can actually have a better version of a democracy by actually allowing people 
to uh, to also like have opinions about like more details. Like of course it doesn't have to be everyone. Maybe people can still just vote for the party and just be uh, be done with it. Uh, but uh, if we would allow actually people the freedom to also like say, okay, I would like to spend my taxes uh, a bit differently than uh, than the party that I'm voting for. Maybe I would like to give more money, for example, I don't know, to science and less be uh, less money to to some uh, to some projects like I don't know some some agriculture things. Uh, like uh, when it comes to uh, some some str strange uh, strange stuff, uh, and some billionaires are getting uh, a lot of uh, money from the state. Uh, uh, so I think that uh, if we would allow this redistribution uh, to be controlled directly by people, at least part of it, it doesn't have to be, of course, everything. Because as uh, Sir was already said, maybe people would not want to fund police until they actually have a problem, which would be too late. Uh, but we can certainly allow people to at least uh, redistribute part of the taxes that they are paying. Uh, in a way that would reflect more like uh, their values and I think that would create a more happy society because or like a, at least people would have a feeling that they are influencing more uh, what what is happening around themselves and I think that uh, would actually make them a bit more happy. Uh, I have the, a couple of questions of... here from, um, oh sorry, go for it. Oh uh, yeah, just uh, to follow up on um... On the point of like technology actually like enabling like these types of this to these types of approaches um i kind of wonder uh this is this is also like an open question i kind of wonder like if we if we could actually you know like use uh transparent tracking of like the, the voting although protecting like the voters from you know like their votes being recognized and there's technology for that today like it's it's not you know it's not some utopia of the future like you can you can use like zero knowledge proof systems and these types of things, which already provide you with like a, a very good uh, um, amount of certainty about like you know these like voting mechanisms being not not exploited um, by you know the central entity. Uh, but it kind of like touches on two two subjects. One of which is um, it would be great like if we could actually like you know pull out like um, this like voting on wherever the money that you actually like pay to the state goes uh but again like we are probably hitting the issue of well it's not actually that everyone in the society in the nation state could use it because you have like very different um like ability to actually like utilize these technologies even now like would you would you exclude like people who are like over 70 or 80 because like they don't have the ability to like use the system uh, and I think that's like one of the one of the hard problems as well. Like, wh where's the where's the balance and you know like setting setting up like um, whoever can use it. But I but I also feel like nation states don't experiment with that far like enough. Like, there should definitely be like tryouts and you know municipal levels and, and that kind of stuff, which I would certainly want to see. Um, and the point B, kind of like touching on. Uh, touching on the, the point that I think like Edmund mentioned before, like, you know, being out of a job as a, as a state employee, like how, you know, compared the, the just the regular like nation state with some notion of like a cloud society, which doesn't necessarily have to be like location based, but it's just like, you know, we can, we, we should probably also like define what a cloud society actually is in, in order to be like, uh, uh, to be able to talk about it properly. But, um, it kind of like brings me to a question of like how bloated the nation states are. Like, what what percentage of like the society is actually like being a recipient of the taxes, and what percentage is just the the, the you know like the pure like payer? Um, and if if you know like the the kind of automation of certain parts of that, like you know perhaps like shifting certain decisions more on a technological layer, if if that could. Uh, make these entities more efficient, or I'm not sure like entity is the right word here, but uh, just these like structures more efficient because I think that's actually the, like for me at least that's the that's the biggest pain of well, you know, throwing money into the system which I see is is just like a legacy, uh, it's just like super outdated in, in the way it works. You mentioned a really interesting thing, which is legacy. And that's actually one of the things with income tax um, that uh, is a heritage of the Napoleonic Wars because um, a lot of the nation states became broke and they needed to pay for the fact that they needed to drive Napoleon out. So they actually introduced income tax. So a lot of the things that we consider to be inherent to our society are actually relatively new, historically speaking. 
But I think what we're observing here in this discussion is uh, two sides of the spectrum. First, some basic evolutionary principles that any society, whether cloud or the nation state, or as long as it involves homo sapiens in some way, will have. So some form of reciprocity, some form of maybe looking after the vulnerable, some form of protection, like basic universal uh, like anatomic parts of uh, how a society is structured. But then we have the things that seem to kind of copy that, but, but are actually like highly culturally relativist, like how do we look after the vulnerable or what type of education should we allow people or things like the moral police and like, you know, how long should the ideal skirt be, etc. And suddenly you're getting into universals versus cultural relativism. And the danger of things, you know, we mentioned post-colonialism is that we implemented something that is highly culturally relativistic, but that was actually considered the optimal way to run a society across more than a quarter of the globe. And suddenly that is now wreaking havoc, you know, a hundred years on. So I'm maybe kind of curious where, like, isn't the cloud society a bit of like a vent that you can have this social pluralism that yes, on one hand you have the nation state, but on the other hand, you have a decentralized, like anonymous cloud society that can fulfill your needs that are not being met by the nation state and that can exist in parallel. But I'm just wondering like, is that possible to have two or more societies running simultaneously that you can be a part of? I would actually maybe, maybe like most of us in the room <laughs> are living in, in such setup. I will wait. <laughs> I suppose the, the, the question for me is what 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 does the cloud society provide? specifically that isn't provided by um isn't provided by by you know norm, normal society the nation state I mean, that, that that that's the main question so let, let's focus it down you know what what is it i mean um you know, maybe joseph you'll be able to answer this like what what is it what more does the cloud society provide yeah i was i was, I was kind of like pointing i'm not sure which joseph you meant though uh you sorry you <laughs> oh uh yeah i mean that, that was the point about like defining defining the cl cloud society but um I, I don't you know i don't know what it means to like other people uh but uh, i would i would actually say like i kind of like live in these like two parallel realms right like i have de definitely have like uh you know my uh, my nation state identity, but uh, I also happen to live in this like uh, Ethereum metaverse with these like various people that uh, can actually already like provide a lot of the services that the traditional world like well could also, but in in some cases I'll certainly be like excluded from those like um, and you know coming back to like the monetary purpose of like cryptocurrencies, well that already is a is a huge chunk actually like you can you can already replace uh the you know the, the means of exchange like the the state-based money with cryptocurrency and you can also get um a handful of services that like traditional banks would provide like getting a loan getting like a collateralized loan without uh being questioned without like kyc without like uh uh you, you know like any constraint uh anyone like checking your like national id card or anything like that and that for me is is already you know um, um, this kind of like spark and well and you can have like much more you can have like insurance uh, that you know is completely like based on like outside of the traditional like jurisdiction you can have like models where uh, dispute resolution is handled like um, in a very decentralized way it's not about like who knows the judge or like who can pay the be better lawyer but you can you can like reach uh, to, you know, this like power of the crowd to, to actually like decide, uh, uh disputes. Um, yeah, and it's just like throwing examples of like what's already out there. Um, but th this is, th these are currently the things that are like useful for me, but I'm, I'm certainly hopeful that there will be like more of these services, um, you know, available or, you know, pe people allowing like, uh, even like such, such basic things as, uh, and, and that's where we maybe like hit the the level of well, it's not really compliant with you know like how nation states work and like it shouldn't be happening within a nation state. So it may be seem uh, uh, illegal in in some ways, but you know like providing uh, providing accommodation like through using using like these crypto services and it's like pearl society where you know like the the exchange with 
a decent level of um, security for like both parties involved in in the transaction of like being the accommodation provider and the person paying uh, can happen with some sort of like dispute resolution mechanism, which uh, would otherwise the state provide, right? Like the jurisdiction where you could go to court or like charge someone or like call the police and so on. Uh, you can you can replace like a whole bunch of these services with like notions of um, your like reputation, which is not based on your like nation identity. It's not based on like the the ID that you that you were given when when you were born, not on the name. It, it's just like a, an address. Well, that you know can belong to anyone, but it happens to belong to you, and you can build your parallel like uh, reputation on, on that. Um, and yeah, then then it comes to the question. Well. Well, maybe providing like accommodation to someone without actually knowing their identity wouldn't be really legal and like how do you pay taxes and so on but well for me kind of you know coming from from like more of a like anarchist background uh why you know like why would i care like if i if i get into into the the setup of well all right i'm i'm fine i, I consent of like not having police to like back me up in this transaction i rely on like this other service where i can charge that person more and it can be like uh, reimbursed for like any damage that that person can uh, can make uh, and I'm willing to accommodate someone without uh, without like uh, you know checking their identity card uh, which like even if you use Airbnb you just like have to like sign these like little pieces of paper nobody checks on that I mean that's, that's also kind of funny but um, um yeah i mean you know why why should why why should the state like know about these things like why should the state care unless i'm asking in return like some some service like you know being protected by police and so on i i, I get your point of like well yeah if something horrible horrible happened well probably i would like go to the police and like ask them for something but at this point very likely because i still pay taxes uh but uh, there, I think there, there's definitely a spectrum of like services that are kind of emerging that where you can already kind of live in this parallel system, the parallel system, and like establishment of you know having some safety nets uh, around like the stuff that you do. But maybe it's really interesting. Sorry. Sorry, go on. Can I? Uh, maybe uh, maybe the, the the question or the task is uh, about the efficiency. Because uh, we talk about about our society and we talk about uh, technology or cloud system or uh, it's it's about really uh, efficiency. Because uh, when you when you look at uh, our society and uh, compare it with uh, anonymity, then uh, uh, with uh, anonymity uh, comes uh, very soon uh, irresponsibility, and uh, irresponsibility is something what uh, what uh, is not not benefit for anybody. So the same is with the with the uh, crypto currency. Uh, it's very good. Uh, I like it because uh, I can pay. Uh, I can pay to or send money to to my friends and uh, not pay taxes to banks. Uh, however, I need to to be uh, uh, aware that uh, the mafia and for drugs and for for uh, weapons uh, it's it's is the best uh, solution. So. Uh, where is the responsibility? And step by step, you will figure out that uh, uh, without uh, without identity, uh, we cannot work. Yeah, because uh, I will I will never invite to my house uh, anybody who I uh, no who I have no chance to check who will come because maybe it will be dangerous for my family, it will be dangerous for me or for my house. So it's not possible. I think that uh, personally, uh, our behavior is still the same thousands of years. And uh, the technology can be used only what, what we are searching for is or look for is for efficiency of our country, nation, nation states and uh, how to in, incorporate it, uh, the new technology. This is the way. But uh, anonymity is, is uh, not the solution. It will be anarchy. And, and in anarchy, I don't want to, to, to lie because, for example, in my family, we had uh, uh, it's it's a really a little bit uh, uh, out of this topic. However, it is what is going to happen in society. Uh, one of my friend uh, he was a uh, drunker, so he, he he was still still uh, with alcohol. And what has happened? Uh, still, people uh, attacked him. And it's something what uh, you know you you don't know. Me me too. 
I don't know anybody, uh, uh, I was never attacked uh, in a society. When I was in metro and when I was outside traveling, nobody attacked me. But my friend, because he was drunk still, every time he, he lost everything. He, he lost uh, his packing, he lost his clothes. He was naked, yeah, when, when, when he fell down uh, on the street. So it is, it is happening here and it is hidden in front of our eyes because we, 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 it's not correspond with our point of view on society. But it's going to happen and anonymity uh, allowed this, uh, this behavior. This is, I'm afraid about it. And I think that step by step you see that now we have internet identity, internet uh, or digital sign, because uh, without it, it never will work. Nothing will work, sorry. <laughs> I think for me, what, I think what's going that... to Sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, I was just going to say quickly, what, what, what for me, so, so J Joseph sort of said quite well, I think what, what for me this sort of cloud society really can provide um, is, is, is interaction, um, you know, sort of, sort of cross-cultural interaction that, you know, otherwise people don't necessarily get. And what that will then lead to is you know, sort of the exchange of ideas, um, you know, new cultures developing, you know, obviously now you've got it around gaming, so like Call of Duty, all that sort of stuff. Um, but, you know, that, that, that will move forward. And, and what that, to me, will prevent, a, you know, will sort of work towards reducing things like racism, potentially sexism, jingoism, um, and allow a sort of greater understanding and a greater sort of connection. I think humans are very based on, you know, what, what can I see? Who do I interact with? Um, and that's really important to them. So, you know, having this cloud society where you are very connected, you know, even maybe just short of physically, but you, know, uh, you have a constant interaction with lots and lots and lots of kind of different people. Um, you know, that, that would be a fantastic, I think, way of you know, trying to combat some of these um, real sort of social issues that, that still are very, very much alive today, you know, from, from Kabul all the way to uh, certainly to, to the US and, and in the UK. There's a lot of interesting things that popped up. Um, we, we have uh, only about 15 minutes remaining of the debate, so I'll just do a very quick um, recap of some of the ideas and then I'll ask some um, questions from Slido that have come in. Um, uh, first of all, I think that a lot of words carry very heavy baggage. Um, one of them is, for example, anarchy. So what is anarchy in terms of like going and throwing a Molotov cocktail at a police station? But what is anarchy in terms of a healthy skepticism that, no, like I don't want to abide by these um, arbitrary rules from the 18th century because I'm a 21st century citizen and it doesn't make sense to me anymore. Um, anonymity in terms of I want to um, live in secret on the dark web because I want to trade drugs or child pornography versus no, I don't want to share my location with Google because I, I might not feel safe doing that or it's my personal choice. So I think that what we really need to understand is that a lot of the words are very low Loaded, um, and loaded words lead to a lot of misunderstanding. Even some, even the fact that we cannot have some debates because they seem to be so loaded with emotion um, and even maybe political beliefs. Um, so I think the first step to a cloud society or even this social pluralism that we're discussing is to just like take a step back um, and like with a calm head see what we're actually assessing and understand the basic principles. Um, so that's the first thing. And the second thing is that what I think that we see emerging from this debate is that. Um, a nation state is almost like a, um, it sometimes puts itself into a position of like an unhealthily possessive, like girlfriend or boyfriend, like that forbids you to go to the pub at all occasions. Um, but you're going to probably like sneak out and find a way to go to the pub anyway. Um, what I'm trying to say is that, yes, there are of course some things that I will go to the nation state for, like Joseph mentioned, like if someone murders someone in the street, like my first reaction is to call the police. But at the same time, if I work in artificial intelligence and I know that the state organs that are dabbling in the regulation of it don't know what the hell they're talking about. I don't want them meddling in my work and maybe stopping my research and um, stopping from key services being provided because uh, technological evolution will be very artificially frozen just because someone feels that they need to regulate something that actually they shouldn't be regulating at all um, in the way that they are. So again, I think uh, a healthy skepticism is right. Um, and make having the freedom to make actual choices and not being pushed into a choice because that's the way that things that should be and that's the way that the right good society works i think that's really important to have a healthy skepticism of the status quo and on that front um we have a couple of um uh, queries emerging from Slido, and I thank you for uh, whoever sent those in. Um, first of all, isn't the virtual slash cloud society more vulnerable than the real and physical one? 
or rather, do the benefits of a cloud society outweigh the vulnerabilities and risks? In what areas do you see more benefits than risks? Um, maybe a quick one for the for the team. Well, maybe I can start. Uh, well, I think that uh, actually following on what you you just said, uh, it would be uh, maybe good if uh, the state, the physical state, and then, uh, like what we are calling today the nation states, if they would be just doing the bare minimum of uh, what is uh, needed and not uh, things uh, that uh, could be, for example, handled better by the by the cloud societies or some other types of uh, like uh, societies uh, which people can uh, join on this uh, voluntary basis. Uh, so I think that would be actually uh, what uh, what I would be happy with uh, if uh, if um, all the politicians would be just uh, just uh, dealing with uh, things like security and uh, like uh, trying to make things. Uh, um, efficient, uh, the few ones that are actually required to be done by the physical state. Uh, but when it comes to uh, things on top of it, I don't know, like education, healthcare, or plenty of other topics uh, uh, where I think uh, actually uh, some parallel societies or governments uh, can emerge and maybe they don't need to be uh, like uh, uh, just uh, located in a single country, but uh, they can be like, say, over the whole Europe or maybe a couple of countries, uh, there there's no need to have some physical boundaries. If you think about like contributing part of your taxes to, for example, educational system or science, science uh, research, uh, uh, or even healthcare, I think that uh, the physical boundaries uh, don't really seem to be that important there. And I totally see that there's a different quality of these services that uh, can be provided. And currently we are kind of like forced by by uh, by our country to contribute uh, money to one single system where we don't really have a choice to uh, escape it or maybe uh, vote for something better and we can just hope that uh, after a couple of decades for example the healthcare system will evolve to start using statistics uh, and start using data sets uh, where it could have been done much sooner if there would be more competition uh, that's the other thing that the state often organizes uh, uh, like uh, like work in areas where actually a monopolistic system is not the best solution. If you would allow some competition and if people would have a choice uh, to pay either this party or that party to provide this uh, type of service, uh, that can actually drive the progress much uh, much faster. Then again, like as I'm already mentioning healthcare quite a bit, that's an example where if you don't have a choice, uh, there will be no change. You will be paying a lot of money in the taxes, but uh, the whole field will stagnate and uh, the technology will be outdated by 10, 15, 20 years in many cases compared to what would be otherwise doable. Thank you. Um, and then I have a um, just a quick comment from Slido actually, um, which again touches on what, something we already discussed, which is that we should differentiate between state as a level of regulation, um, in brackets, moving to a supranational one, and state as a point of reference of collective identity. Um, this is actually, um, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive deep into archaeology because it's the only thing that I know something about. <laughs> um, and uh, it's really interesting how actually nation states have used uh, archaeology artificially in the past to create an identity. And a lot of the times, the more dictatorial a regime, the better off the archaeologists were if we look at um what Mussolini did for um like Ro Roman excavations um or like of, of the Roman Empire or in, indeed the Ananerba underneath the Nazis and the very fake national history that they try to create in order to justify the existence of the nation state again we have to question the architecture the symbols the identity around us in order to actually understand what the nation state is doing artificially to evoke this feeling of timelessness and status quo um, and what is just um, something that is a political agenda. Um, maybe, actually, what, one quick question for Karel here. Um, uh, to what extent um, is, the, uh, is the identity of the state reflected in architecture or what is your personal experience with that? Uh, <laughs> Uh, maybe, maybe can you repeat the question because I don't, I don't know if I, if I understood well. Uh, if, what, if you ask uh, for the future or what is now? Um, probably what is now. Um, so uh, basically, the comment from Slido is that 
um, the nation state is often a reference of cultural identity of people. Um, and a lot of the times that's reflected in architecture. So my question is just like your opinion on that, like to what extent yeah. um, national identity is reflected in architecture now? Okay, uh, so when uh, in case uh, in case we talk about the national identi identity, uh, for me personally, it's it's not because uh, we are European identity. Uh, when you see our our architecture style uh, in a, in a history, uh, we are sharing them with uh, with our neighbors. So there is nothing like uh, really Czech uh, Czech design. And of course, it was 100 years ago, but uh, it was only a few examples. So I think that we have uh, maybe continental continental um, uh, identity and it, the reflection is according to uh, I think nature yeah because uh, uh, we have we have a different different temperature than uh, than in South Europe or in Africa that's why uh, it, it was uh, shaping our architecture more than than our identity because uh, okay we can we can uh, as a human beings uh, we reflected uh, our designs uh, by by the uh, by the uh, different periods of life However, still everything corresponds uh, on our position on the globe. So I think that uh, from my, pos uh, my point of view, uh, my personal identity is now European. Uh, I'm very proud of that. Uh, and I am uh, feeling myself uh, less and less uh, as a uh, Czech, uh, Czech uh, uh, from Czech Republic. Uh, for me, uh, European Union is much more important and I'm, I'm proud of that. So I, and I see that in architecture, it is, it is obviously the same situation. Thank you. Sorry, can I come um, in? And oh. I've got, yes, you can Edmund. And let's um, uh, maybe the last contribution from, from each of you, if you just want to have your parting thoughts because this has been a hell of a discussion. So um, maybe like closing remarks um, and then we'll round this panel off and we'll move into the workshops on Zoom afterwards. Thank you so much. So, yeah, I mean, so just to very quickly to answer that one, and I think sort of w one of the main sort of cause of this is that there, there are two things. You've got the state and then you've got nations as well. So nations much more sort of linked to people's ethnicity, identity, that sort of state being more of a sort of a way that we organize ourselves. I think in all of this, uh, sort of what we've been talking about here and, and what sort of needs to be made clear is that we have these primordial ideas of, you know, our own identity, so I am Ed, I'm a British Army officer, I'm English, whatever, you know, I'm, um, but the, 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 these primordial ideas of sort of bounded societies, we need to get away from that, we need to move beyond that, because actually we are incredibly interconnected, um, you know, with the low level sort of globalization, trade, that sort of stuff, all the way through to the flow of ideas, through media, language, um, there aren't clear boundaries, and I think for me, you know this 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 cloud society is going to be a really really interesting way sort of the next almost logical jump in that actually you know it's 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 sort of it's completely unbounded this society you know peter someone in kuala lumpur can be talking directly with someone in you know ireland or or, or whatever it is you can have these communities that aren't at all based on um certainly based on, on either the nation or the state um so you know getting away from these yeah getting away from these primordial ideas of boundedness um you know mary midgley talks about um we see cultures as uh, like billiard balls on a table. It's actually not. It's more like a, a massive ball of string that's all interconnected. So um, maybe the cloud society is something that uh, you know is 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 the next step in that. Thank you so much, Edmund. Um, and Josef, how about yourself? Um, any closing remarks? Um. Yeah, also just want to say thanks to everybody. This is my last chance uh, for for discussion so far. But uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I remain optimistic. Like I, I think like the technology to like enable, you know, this like global um, coordination between, you know, like communities, not only like on the state level, but literally between the individuals um, uh, and, you know, it's, it's here and just like these Cloud societies actually already exist on a very on a very basic level. Uh, I would certainly love to see like more, I guess, like for, formal approach to these like parallel societies and actually seeing like examples of, uh, you know, like a formalized society which is like accepted by these like states or nation states. Uh, that's I, I think it's certainly something to strive for in the, in the next decades and. Uh, 
I'm, I'm hopeful that we, we are actually going to see like uh, some of these entities kind of actually getting uh, recognition and like gaining legitimacy uh, within the, the legacy world. Thank you. I think we've got our first five citizens right here, um, if I'm not being presumptive. <laughs> um, Tomasz, um, you'll be uh, closing this off uh, before I um, do the final spiel. So what are your thoughts about the debate and your closing yeah. remarks? Yeah, I think it was it was interesting debate and uh, I, I'm looking forward to the future where maybe the like uh, cloud societies or some parallel societies will take over some of these uh, optional responsibilities uh, that are currently are are maintained uh, by the state like services that are not necessary but are kind of helpful for for us uh, um, where there's actually no competition um, that would drive uh, progress there so I think that we will uh, see in the future societies where there will be competition over these optional services then I think uh, that would be amazing and it would uh, make our lives better. So, uh, so let's hope that this will happen one day. Let's hope for that indeed. Um, it has been, ladies and gentlemen, we have gone from evolution to swarm intelligence to principles of exchange uh, to the British army to um, the Roman Empire to cryptocurrencies to artificial intelligence. But I think there is one connected underlying principle, and that is that the next decade is going to be a decade of choice of um, healthily uh, questioning the status quo and some form of parallelity because exactly as Edmund said the human uh, civilization is a massive ball of string and we're more interconnected and everything the, the butterfly effect that we're living in every single day leads to a very complex system that we're living in and the only way that we can arm ourselves is being open-minded um, is having actual critical thinking being healthily skeptical and being able to live maybe in more societies than one I would really like to thank the Next Gen Network for making this possible, as well as Microsoft, as well as the Aspen Institute, but also notably our amazing speakers, no, namely Karel Smekal, Tomasz Mikolov, Josef Vier, and Edmund Owen. Thank you so much for being here. And it was actually one of the best debates that I've ever been on. The vibe was great and you guys were awesome. And thank you also to our uh, to all the hundreds and thousands of people that watched us or will watch us in the coming weeks because if you haven't watched this then you're missing out um ladies and gentlemen thank you again um and we'll be moving on to zoom um which you would have received the link for where Josef and myself will have workshops and karel tomash and edmund i'm sure that we'll see you very very soon thank you thank you see you all ciao bye everyone Aspen Institute Central Europe is an open and interdisciplinary dialogue platform where political, business and non-profit leaders as well as leading personalities from art, sports and science meet and interact. We organize public conferences, seminars and expert discussions on the most pressing issues with the goal of having an impact beyond the conference room. Our programs aim to improve the quality of decision-making processes. Every year, we gather at the flagship event called The Shape of Central Europe, a conference where expert groups present their year-round work and offer a comprehensive look at the development of the region and further recommendations. We also organize both public and policy debates on European and transatlantic matters technology and digitalization, artificial intelligence, education, reskilling and upskilling, and many others. Thanks to our leadership programs, more than 300 exceptional leaders across various professional fields from Central Europe have already been challenged to explore their core values and got engaged in dialogue about issues critical for society's development. As a regional partner of the Global Aspen Institute Network, we provide the local audience with the world-renowned experts from various disciplines. The 
Aspen Institute Central Europe is an independent platform where people from business, culture, politics, public institutions and sport meet and discuss. If you are one of them, get inspired, be part of Aspen or follow Aspen.